Okay, um, we'll get started. Um, uh, as I said to those who were here a bit earlier, uh, my name is uh, Professor John Dickinson. Uh, I'm a professor within the School of Exercise Sciences. Um, and today I'm going to basically just spend about 15 to 20 minutes uh, talking through this uh, question of basically can you be an elite athlete with a breathing problem? And um, before I kick into it, just a little bit about sort of where, where my, my background. Uh, I've been at the University of Kent for, for eight years. And um, previous to that, I've worked at Liverpool John Moores University. And previous to that, I've worked within the British Olympic Association and the English Institute of Sport. And throughout all, all, all of my time, since I graduated um, as an undergraduate sports scientist, I've gone on to, to conduct research and applied work with athletes, looking at uh, their respiratory system, and trying to understand athletes' respiratory systems and why athletes might complain of breathing problems during their sport, and then looking at how we can help athletes overcome those breathing problems. Um, and so that, that's sort of my background. Um, in terms of how I interaction with, with this session, um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll probably just talk through the presentation for, for 15 minutes. Um, but as we go along, feel free to, to ask questions in, in the chat or the Q&A section. And then once um, once I finish talking, I'll, I'll we'll, we'll take those questions on and I'll, I'll talk through them. Um, but obviously, if you want to save questions to the very end, feel free to to just type them in after I've uh, finished speaking. Okay. So, question is: Can you be an elite athlete with a breathing problem? Hopefully, the slide's going to move on. There we go. So, if just to refresh your memories, if you've forgotten what the spirit system looks like, um, obviously. You've got your respiratory system, which um, includes what we call the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. And basically what we sort of refer to as the, as the um, upper respiratory tract is basically sort of anything above the trachea is the upper respiratory tract and anything below the uh, trachea is the lower respiratory tract. And athletes could have a, a respiratory issue that might be upper respiratory or lower respiratory. Um, so you need to bear that in mind when athletes uh, might complain of, might complain of a um, breathing problem. Um, and the uh, infrastructure around the the upper and, uh, upper and lower respiratory tract are we've got our um, rib cage and our inspiratory and expiratory um, respiratory muscles that enable us um, to change the pressures inside of the the, the lungs, and that allows uh, air to move through the respiratory tract in and out of the lungs to allow for gas exchange. So when we look at what we might refer to as the components of respiration, we, we can break down respiration into sort of four stages. The first stage is what, we, what is technically known as pulmonary ventilation, or what we might otherwise call as breathing. The second stage is pulmonary diffusion. So that is the, the exchange of gases at the uh, alveoli, the, the ends, ends of the, um, of the uh, respiratory tree in the lung. Um, where the oxygen can obviously diffuse from the from the lungs into um, the the blood, and carbon dioxide will diffuse the other way from the blood into the into the lungs and then to be expelled. Um, the third stage is looking at the transportation of oxygen and carbon dioxide around the body through uh, in the blood, and the fourth stage is what we might know as cellular respiration, and that is gas exchange from the blood at the capillaries to working cells. So that is gas exchange of oxygen into the working cell that can be then used to generate um, ATP um, aerobically and also then the exchange of carbon dioxide from the working cell into the blood to then get um, expelled from, from the body. So sometimes you might refer to the, the, the first two stages as external uh, and the second two as internal. Now, what I'm really going to focus on when we talk about respiratory or breathing problems we're talking about that first stage. Um, so initially, you say, can you be an elite athlete with a breathing problem? Now, I'd say if, if that breathing problem was not appropriately diagnosed or managed, the athlete will, will not likely to be able to perform at their potential, which probably means if you have a breathing problem and it's not managed particularly well, it's going to be very difficult for you to become an elite athlete. And that could be down to... Um, because you've got the breathing, breathing problem, it can compromise um, oxygen and, and uh, CO2 transfer um, at, the, at the alveoli or even um, ability to supply, to supply oxygen uh, and get rid of CO2 um, through the, your breathing pattern. Um, and also neural feedback. If you're breathing erratically, um, that will send information 
uh, centrally that might then lead to other systems being being shut down. So in a short short word, if you've got a breathing problem, you don't manage it particularly well, you're going to struggle to be an elite athlete. However, this is where us as sport and exercise scientists, sports therapists, we can help support um, sport, sports medicine teams um, to help athletes overcome these uh, respiratory uh, symptoms they may be reporting. But we need to understand where these respiratory symptoms may, may come from and what these respiratory symptoms may be. So some typical respiratory symptoms uh, from an athlete might be a tight chest when they exercise, it might be coughing, uh, it might, that might, that cough might be a dry cough or a cough that brings up mucus. It might be a sore chest after they've finished exercising. It could be that when they're exercising, they don't feel they can take a satisfying breath and therefore they feel that their breathing's limited how far, how far and fast they, they might be able to run or cycle. And so we need to understand all of these symptoms and, and what might be causing them. So sometimes respiratory symptoms can be caused by cardiovascular disorders. Um, sometimes they can be, can be caused by physical limit, limitations, i.e. you're not fit enough or maybe carrying a little bit too, uh, too much excess fat. So, so you might be defined as obese or you led a sedentary lifestyle for a particular long period of time. Um, other issues might be more direct to issues that might be linked to the respiratory tract. Um, and they may be things like exercise-induced asthma or asthma itself. Um, they could be uh, things that link to a dysfunctional breathing. And dysfunctional breathing, that could be an inappropriate breathing pattern. It could be more of a structural thing where your larynx closes, so that it is a closure in the upper, upper airway. Um, or it could be that you have some sort of anxiety hyperventilation uh, syndrome. And all of these things may impact uh, or may bring about these respiratory symptoms. From my experience, the cardiovascular the cardiovascular disorders um, are mainly dealt with um, by, by cardiovascular um, sports medics. Um, so when I work with athletes with a specific breathing problem, they usually um, come, come in and it's usually either an upper respiratory tract issue that could be the larynx, it could also be a nasal issue, um, or it's a lower respiratory tract issue, which is usually in the form of, of an asthma-related condition. Um, and so I'm just going to talk through why athletes um, or the, the prevalence of these um, respiratory conditions that I see, and then maybe just talk through how we might overcome them with, it, with, um, um, with various different uh, techniques. So if we take asthma initially, uh, if you look at the population of the UK, 9% of the UK population have an asthma-related condition. But if you look at the British Olympic team, so some of the data that I collected in my PhD, um, we, we know that around about 21% of that British Olympic team have an asthma-related condition. Um, so if you're an elite Olympian, um, you've, the, the likelihood is that you've got to d double the chance um, of having an asthma-related condition compared to the, to the general population. Now, when we actually split it up by sport, the, the, the prevalence between sports is quite, quite dramatic. So if we look at sports like badminton and boxing, you can see the prevalence in, their, in those sports are similar to the UK um, our, uh, prevalence population. But then when we look at sports like cycling, field hockey, rowing, swimming, football, the prevalence significantly increases when, when, you, when you compare it to the UK uh, population. And so it might be the demands of the sport or the environment that the sport takes place in increase the chances of an athlete experiencing an asthma-related uh, condition. And so, but we need to understand that um, athletes are very much more susceptible uh, to, to asthma. And, there, and once we understand that, we can start to look at how we can help those athletes with asthma best control their condition and basically allow them to compete um, basically on a level playing field with, with athletes that haven't got asthma. And so we worked really closely with the, the British swimming team in the build-up to the last um, Olympic Games in Rio, and we've also done a similar thing to, uh, for the next Olympic Games, which obviously we're supposed to be around about now in Tokyo, but will happen next year now. Um, so I just want to talk through some basic, some simple lessons that we, that we helped athletes with to help them overcome their asthmatic um, issues. So initially, we wanted to find out what the prevalence was of asthma within the swimming team. And we actually were lucky enough to be able to test the British boxing team and the British swimming team. 
um, for asthma related conditions. And what we found with it with, with the boxes, um, they had a prevalence of 8%, which is similar to the UK population. But with the swimmers, we found they nearly had a, well, they had a prevalence of 68%, which is ridiculously high when you compare that to the um, UK population. Um, so there's various different reasons why swimmers may be more susceptible um, to asthma-related conditions than, than boxers. But what we found was they, wasn't, they weren't just more susceptible to it. The actual severity of the asthma was, was greater in the swimmers than it was in the boxers as well. And one of the major reasons for this was, was partly down to the demands of, of swimming. So if you think about how hard boxers work and how hard swimmers work in, in, in their various training. They both reach similar ventilation rates when you look at how the peak um, ventilation rate of a box and the peak ventilation, ventilation rate of a swimmer probably aren't too, too different. What is different, though, is the length of time that the athletes spend at those um, high ventilation rates. So a boxer may train very hard, but in three-minute bursts, and they'll likely only do that for half, uh, probably 40 minutes to, to an hour in, in a hard training session or, or a very tough um, boxing bout. Whereas a swimmer will will spend around about two two and a half hours in a pool, um, maybe um, for each well for each session, and they might do two sessions a day, and they're likely to be in the pool five to six days a week. Um, so they've got a significant they over the course of a day they're significant got significantly higher um, ventilation rate during their training, uh, and also they're training for a longer period of time as well. Coupled along with that. It, um, the environment that they're training in is obviously massively different. So the boxing gym is usually a nice condition. In the picture at the top there is of the of the British Boxing uh, Training Headquarters in Sheffield, and it's nicely conditioned, nice and clean. Very very few um, pollutants in the gym itself. Um, and if we look at the swimming pool here, um, this is one of the pools that the guys train in. Um, it's a nice environment, um, but the one of the problems is is the, the chlorine in the pool that, that cleans the pool. It releases a gas called trichloramine once it's cleaned, cleaned the, the, the dirt in the pool. And this gas is it, quite heavy gas, so it doesn't necessarily just fl float away from the pool um, easily. And if you're a recreational swimmer, it's not usually a problem. But if, you're, if you've got an elite swimmer breathing, ventilating at a high rate and for a sustained period of time, they're going to breathe in a lot of this trichloramine. And potentially, this can lead to increases in, 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 in uh, inflammation processes inside the lung and can lead to uh, increases in, in hypersensitivity, which can lead to development of uh, an exercise-induced um, as asthma issue. And so that's sort of the reason why we think certain sports are more um, uh, susceptible to asthma than others. And that basically means that they, certain sports have a higher breathing um, requirement to them and they also take place in, in environments that may be what we call say, more asthmogenic, so they're more likely to trigger off an asthma response. And that might be a trichloramine environment like, like the swimmers, but it could also be a cold, dry environment. So sports that take place in the winter, train outdoors, that is another uh, reason why athletes in those sorts of sports may be more susceptible. Another thing we can do is once we detected athletes with, with, with asthma, you need to make sure that they're on the right inhalers that are going to uh, control their condition. But we also need to make sure they're taking their inhaler appropriately. And when we did this with the swimmers, we found that their inhaler technique was pretty good, apart from this little one that's highlighted in red here, the fact that the way they were, they, they were inhaling uh, wasn't, optimal, op, wasn't optimum. So when we look at um, an inhaler like a salbutamol inhaler, ideally when an athlete breathes in, they need to breathe in nice and steady and slowly at around about a ventilation rate of about 30 liters per minute, which is a very slow inhalation and a full inhalation when we looked at our elite swimmers we found that their average inhalation rate when they were pretending to take their inhaler was more than 10 times the recommended speed now the problem with that if you breathe an inhaler in too fast a lot of the um medicine sticks to the back of your it sticks in your upper respiratory tract so it sticks in the back of your throat rather than reaching uh the the lungs and the and the small airways where, which is where you want the med, the, the uh, medication to act so therefore, it becomes less effective, and so the athlete is, is less, less well protected. So our solution to that was to use these little pocket chambers, which have little whistles on them. And when they, if the athlete breathed in too fast, the pocket chamber whistled, and so the athlete needed to, to reduce the speed of their inhalation. Just a, and that's a very effective way of improving their, um, improving their um, 
uh, use of the medication. Another simple thing we did was we actually conducted a retest with them. So once we'd initially done our test to diagnose uh, an asthmatic issue, we then um, worked, with their, with, worked, worked, worked with the team doctor to um, get them on suitable inhalers. And then we retested them um, at a later point to make, to make sure those inhalers were, were effective. Uh, and this is just an example of one of, the, one of the swimmers where in February, when we, did, when we do our test to diagnose the asthma there, their lung function fell away of nearly 40%. And then when we um, retested them uh, three months later, when they were using the appropriate inhalers, their lung function only fell 7%. And that demonstrated to us that their lung function it was much healthier and they were less likely to experience an asthma response in, in the swimming pool. And then the last thing that we, that, we, that we saw was that a lot of swimmers, even though we had evidence that we'd controlled their asthma appropriately um, and they had a good inhaler technique, they were still, some of them were still, well, all of them were still reporting some symptoms. And then when we actually looked at what else could be causing those symptoms, we, we worked with, with spiritual consultants and, and used a variety of different techniques. But well, basically what we found was pretty much every swimmer that had an asthmatic issue also had at least one other breathing issue. And you can see from the little diagram on the left there, some of those were to do with reflux, some of them were to do with um, in, uh, breathing pattern issues, some of them were to do with a nasal disease, and others were to do with laryn uh, a laryngeal closure. So just because we we'd initially identified the athlete might have an asthmatic issue, that wasn't necessarily, it wasn't necessarily then that every time they had breathing symptoms that it was asthma that was causing the problem. And so we had to work very sort of um, systematically to make sure the asthma was controlled. But then if, if they were still reporting symptoms to consider that another respiratory issue may also be, may also be present. And what we said, said we found in the swimmers was that, that everyone had asthma, had also had no, another issue as well. And we had to manage that. Some of the issues were well, very common that um, athletes who have significant respiratory problems during, or breathing problems during exercise have dysfunctional, what we call dysfunctional breathing. And this is when an athlete is, is uh, unable to breathe efficiently um, or their breathing pattern is inappropriate for, for their response. So it's, this isn't, dysfunctional breathing isn't caused by uh, asthma. It's not caused uh, by other respiratory or not directly caused by a, a respiratory disease per se. Um, but basically what dysfunctional breathing, it, dysfunctional breathing pattern is, is when the, um, when the chest wall doesn't move effectively and it doesn't move uh, synchronously uh, to allow the, the, the ribs to uh, expand appropriately and then, and th then air come into the, into the lungs appropriately. So this is, an, is a um, clip of an athlete um, who has a dysfunctional breathing pattern in the absence of uh, of of of, um, of any other respiratory problem? Um, so just play the video. So you'll see her come in. And if you listen carefully, you'll hear when she's breathing, she's she's wheezing. But when she's wheezing, she's breathing in, and that wheeze when someone breathes in is is a laryngeal issue. Stand up for me. You stand up and just look straight, just look, stand still and look straight ahead. And what you'll notice when she's breathing, if you look at her stomach and her chest, they're not moving at the same time. They're moving at different times. And ideally what we should see is the, the chest and the stomach should move uh, together. So just re pull that back a little bit. Watch. You stand up and just look straight, just look, stand still and look straight ahead. You can see the stomach move and the, and the chest head. wall move. And that basically, that sort of movement doesn't allow the chest wall to expand appropriately um, and causes a lot of um, feedback centrally, which basically it sort of sends, makes the person feel like they can't get a satisfying breath, can feel quite painful and effortful to breathe. And ultimately, they struggle to, um, to supply effective um, levels of oxygen uh, uh, to it with uh, and get them in within in in their system and there obviously then that obviously has um, effects down downstream in terms of the how how much um, the athlete can can um, produce energy aerobically so therefore they have to use more anaerobic systems and they're more likely to fatigue earlier and so therefore 
and when they do things like high intensity runs like 400 meter efforts they really struggle to do multiple efforts in in, in those sort of um at that sort of level and so there are slight differences between what we might call as exercise induced asthma versus dysfunctional breathing um issues and so things like wheeze happens on expiration and asthma but inspiration in dysfunctional breathing some a lot of time um people with dysfunctional breathing feel uh, quite dizzy um usually if there's a any usually um asthmatics might bring up some sort of uh, mucus after they finished exercise dysfunctional breathing that doesn't usually happen um and if we look at when the shortness of breath or tight chest might occur within asthma usually that happens after someone's finished the exercise whereas dysfunctional breathing it usually occurs during and as soon as the individual stops within two to three minutes, they're, they're breathing fine in there and their symptoms are reduced quite, quite a lot. So there are some, some differences. And just really, just to sort of finish off the, the session, um, these are some of the things that we're doing at the moment within the University of Kent to actually look at how to measure and monitor breathing pattern. Because this is one of the things that isn't particularly well understood around what a good breathing pattern is. And so at the moment, we, we've got systems, we've got um, a 3D motion camera um, analysis system where we can basically um, track uh, the movement of the chest and abdomen wall and we can develop a 3D model of, of the chest wall that allows us to really accurately um, figure out what how the chest wall should move in a, in a non-symptomatic healthy individual and then compare that to individuals that are reporting breathing problems. And what we can do is in a simp simplistic way we can split abdomen movement versus ribcage movement and this is a uh, a figure that demonstrates abdomen movement uh, at the bottom here and ribcage on, on the side. And as we move left to right in the figure, that's when someone's breathing in. And when someone's breathing out, we're going right to left. And what you'll see is as the abdomen moves, the ribcage moves. And we know that because the, the figure, the lines are going up in a nice 45 degree angle. So that means as the abdomen's moving, the ribcage is moving as we breathe in. And then as the abdomen moves, the rib and the ribcage moves as we breathe out, nice and smooth track to it and we can compare that against various um various issues so the top one here is the healthy individual where you've got a nice 45 degree angle going on but the second one down here is is someone with a with a asthmatic issue and you see their breathing pattern is is slightly different where they're you really moving their abdomen first then their chest then they're moving the chest and then their abdomen to breathe back in and then you've got a dysfunctional breather at the bottom where there's all sorts of chaos going on where it's sort of an abdomen rib cage abdomen rib cage movement and it's not particularly synced up and what ultimately happens with this bottom uh, movement here when we actually then not just look at the movement but look at the volumes of air that are moving in and out we see a significant reduction in the amount of air that they breathe per breath and therefore they have a higher breathing frequency when you compare them to a to a healthy healthy breather so the trick would be once we've identified that, can we train them? And there's various different ways we, we can use to use various breathing pattern um, techniques to help athletes overcome this. So if we just go back to that athlete we saw at the start, and um, when I started talking about dysfunctional breathing, you can see this is her. Um, this is on the 21st of October last year. Can you stand up for me. You stand up. And just look straight. Just look, stand still and look straight ahead. Watch her chest and abdomen move in. Okay. Quite uncontrolled, lots of movement going on here. Does it stay there? Keep looking quite, straight ahead. Quite distressed. And then if we look at her two months later after we'd worked with her to help her improve her breathing you pattern. Stand up for us. Just look dead straight forward. Okay, so you just pull your shirt much tight less you movement. Can. So I can see it. it. You can see her chest and abdomen moving much closer together. So the movement's much more coordinated. Good work. And then from the back you'll see that you get much more lateral movement inside of her rib cage here and here. So that basically means that she's moving her rib cage more effectively, and therefore she's actually able to deliver more air into in, into her, uh, her, her airways per breath, and therefore she's going to get a better diffusion of oxygen and CO2, and also that's going to have downstream effects, going to allow her to train harder, um, and then also uh, com compete better. So just in summary, I guess the question is: Can you be an elite athlete with a breathing problem? As we said at the start of the start of the presentation, not, not if the breathing problem is not appropriately managed, but yes, you can be an elite athlete with a breathing problem if that breathing problem is appropriately detected and managed. And in most cases, athletes can perform unhindered. Uh, so therefore, an athlete can is able um, with a with an, an issue with a breathing problem can train and compete as if they didn't have that breathing problem, 
as long as it's well managed and detected. And we've got multiple examples of elite of athletes going on to win world championships and and all sorts um, break break world records when they have a breathing problem, but it is well managed. So that's the end of my presentation. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. But if anyone's got any uh, questions or anything, uh, please do uh, pop them in the chat or the Q and A's. Okay. Okay. So, um, Kalia is just just popped in here. Um, can, can elite athlete can elite swimmer develop asthma because of the sport, or can the sport only increase the severity of a pre-existing condition? That's a really really interesting question, and it it's one I'm probably going to sit on the fence on um, with it with an answer. But um, but it could be it, it can be either. So, um, an elite athlete may, an athlete may go into a sport and develop uh, an asthmatic condition from simply taking part in that sport and competing in, in a polluted environment over a long period of time. There's evidence in research that suggests that um, breathing in polluted substances over time can cause what we, what we call airway remodeling. And basically, that means that the particles eventually cause changes to the airway lining uh, and make it more susceptible to or more hypersensitive so it produces more airway inflammation. And you can develop asthmatic issues from either training and competing in, in, in polluted environments. So you, you also see, if you just look at demographics of people with respiratory issues like COPD and asthma, they tend to have higher prevalences in high polluted areas. So it is possible for, a, for an individual to go into a sport and potentially develop an asthmatic issue from, from the, the respiratory demands and the environment um, that they're training in over time. Um, so it's not just that we need to track swimmers that we know about that might have asthma um, going in, going into that elite elite sport. And just to just to put that in context with um, with the British swimming team of the of the sixty eight percent of the swimmers that that we that we detected, about two thirds of those that we detected didn't have a history of asthma, and so they 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 either didn't realise had an asthma response and uh, had an asthma issue. Um, before they started in the in the elite elite groups, or um, they may have developed it um, because of the elite sport. Now we don't know the answer to that, um, it sort of uh, specifically, but um, there there are some there is some research that suggests that it's possible to to develop asthma from uh, taking part in in elite sport over a prolonged period of time. It's a nice question. Very good. Cool. Um, I'm quite happy to to to, to take um, any more questions. Any more? Okay. Well, what we what we do? I think we've recorded this session anyway. So, if you've got any questions that you're not that you you want to sort of email me, my my email um, is uh, j dot w dot dickinson 
um, at kent.ac.uk. So it's j.w.dickinson, but D I C K I N S O N, at kent.ac.uk. Feel very, very welcome to email me with any questions off the back of it. Um, also, if you're if you're coming to Kent um, to study um, one of our one of our degrees, either sports therapy, sport and exercise science, or sport uh, um, exercise uh, science for health, um, you're very very welcome to pop up to our respiratory clinic to to watch what we do and how we work with athletes. Um, a lot of what we do um, in the in the actual clinic is based a lot on the research that that we do as well. So it's a lot of the time sort of um, I guess sort of lead leading in in various areas that, that that we're also researching in is in as well so very welcome to, to come and visit the clinic um or even take part in some of our some of our research projects if you're interested in finding out how it all works so um thanks a lot for for listening in um, and hopefully i'll uh, i'll catch up with you all in in september or october um one way or another either via by an online lecture or by a, a face-to-face uh, seminar So stop the recording.